Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. It's indeed my great pleasure to welcome to our show today, Rabbi Shai Shechter. For those of you who don't know Rabbi Shechter, uh, he is one of the more prolific young Rabbonim in our world community today, not only uh, giving 1,500 shirim on YU Torah, but also in his role as the rabbi in the Rosh Beis Medrash of the Young Israel of Woodmere, in the role he plays as well in overseeing the adult educational programs there as the spiritual leader in the Rav of Yachad, the rabbi of Camp Simcha, in so many different places, Rav Schechter has now had an impact. And as you may notice by his last name, he comes from one of the most distinguished rabbinic families in our community, and that is his father is Rav Herschel Schechter Shlita. I can't forget his mother, Rebbets in Shoshana as well. And then on top of all of that, he is the grandson of the Rosh Kolo, Rav Melech. There's so many different pieces that Rav Shechter brings to the puzzle and so much that he continues to do. And it's a true pleasure, Rav Shechter, to join, that you're joining us today. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Rabbi Matenki. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Now, it's, uh, it's great to have you. And I guess, let me just start from the simple thing. And that is, you're Rav Shechter's son. You are Rav Shechter as well, but you're Rav Shechter's son. What was it like growing up in that house with the Rav, the Rebbets, and with all of your brothers and sisters? What was it like growing up? So it's an interesting question. I'll start with the question that you didn't ask, which was, um, you refer to me as Rav Shechter. I never in my lifetime will be comfortable being known as such. And uh, that's why in my shul, they all call me Rav Shai. It's just uh, much simpler, although everybody knows clearly when they need the real Rev Schefter and when they're just looking for the imposter like me. But still, I'm a, I'm a lot more comfortable not being known as Rev Schefter, um, not because uh, only because of great respect and admiration for my father. And he is Rev Schefter. So growing up in my parents home uh, was we had a very normal home for anyone who's ever met my father. You will know uh, my father is a very, very normal person. And in some way, I feel that's his greatest godless. That's his, that is his greatness, that he just lives life with such a simplistic elegance. And that really is um, the beauty of who my father is and the kind of home that they raised us in. I do remember growing up that at least I uh, did not realize that my father was any greater than any of my elementary school teachers or rabbi. Uh, he considered himself an equal whenever we came home and we shared anything from our Rebbe. He always respected it. He listened carefully, um, even if he knew what we were saying was certainly wrong or, or incorrect in some way. He would never, ever say anything negative about our teachers. And as a result of that, we assumed that he was the same as everyone else. And it wasn't until we got much older that we realized who my father actually is. Uh, I do remember distinctly, you mentioned my, my grandfather's a frontal bracha. I do remember distinctly that my grandfather used to tell us, you don't understand, you're living with a walking Sefer Torah in your house. And I really didn't understand as a child what he meant. But he said it was the greatest privilege of his life that he has a son who is a walking Sefer Torah. And after I heard that, it sort of made me begin to think about what that means and what exactly it is that we're living with. And that's, uh, in a nutshell, that's really the experience that many of us had as children. Now, it was fascinating. I was sitting with your father a few nights ago at a wedding in New York, and uh, we were talking, and we were talking a bit about the the proclivity people have today to study Dafyomi. And I said, in a certain sense, I kind of miss the days when Balabatim studied Ein Yaakov. It was simpler. They understood what it was. And uh, he made a comment to me that caught me off guard. He said, you know, when he was in yeshiva, there was a, another fellow who was getting smicha at the same time. And if I'm quoting correctly, he said he really can't learn Rashi. But he was getting smicha, and he felt a little bit bad that how is his smicha, and he's getting smicha at the same time. And this fellow got a, became a rav in the South. And I see from your smile, you probably know the story well. And he sent boys to the yeshiva and he built a shul and he did all of these things. And your father said to me, he said, you know, maybe he's accomplished more in life than I've done. I've only, I give a good sheer. And that I think is one of the great ex expressions of your father's humility. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, it's it, his humility is legendary. And um, I remember him telling the story many, many times that you just mentioned. But just to add a flair to it, he says that I think it was at the time when there was a question about the draft and whether he would be drafted or this other student would be drafted. And my father felt very uncomfortable. How am I being put in the same draft selection as this young man who, what kind of contribution is he going to actually make? And he said that as a young man, that's how he felt. And later on in life, he looks back and he reflects. Both of them ended up not having to go to the draft, but he says that he reflects now and he thinks about what a powerful impact that Rav has had uh, on his community and and the generations of Jewish families that are going to come from the determination that he's had as being a communal leader. Now, you you went to, to Ner Yisrael after, for high school as well, and then you continued to learn in Ner Yisrael. You didn't go straight to Yeshiva, uh, Yeshiva being Yeshiva University in Reitz. Was there a reason for that? Um, I went away already for ninth grade. Uh, my father was a tremendous proponent of the style of learning that they have in Nari Israel in high school. Um, he liked very much that every year of high school, you master a complete Masechta Bikiyos, and you know it by heart, backwards and forwards, which really anyone who knows anything about Nari Israel high school knows that to be true. Uh, my father really um, was very, very excited about that possibility. And uh, I was excited to go. It wasn't really a major discussion. It was just, do you want to go? Yes, I tried it out. I went and I had a really fantastic couple of years in Eretz Yisrael. From there, I went to the Mir Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael um, and really tried to gain as much as I could from all the different stops along the way. And you came back, to, then you came back to Yeshiva. And what brought you back? So that's interesting. Uh, in fact, all of my friends in the Mir Yeshiva that I had developed all the friendships over the years, uh, they were all planning on going to Lakewood after we were finished in the Mir Yeshiva. That seemed to be the trend. And one fine day, Rav Nassim Svi Finkel, um, who I was not particularly close with, he called me into his office and he asked me, what do you plan to do after Pesach? And I told him that I was planning to go to Lakewood. And he said, why would you go to Lakewood? So I said, well, that's what all my friends are doing. He said, no, I didn't ask what are your friends doing? I asked, why are you going to Lakewood? Yeah. So I didn't really know what to say. And he said to me, your tafkid is you need to take advantage of the gift of your father. You need to go to Yeshiva University. You need to learn with your father and become a big Talmud Chacham. And he started to cry and he said, you will have opportunities to teach Torah in places where they would never let me in the door. And he said, how can a person who takes responsibility in life shy away from such an opportunity? And it was so eye-opening to me and uh, really going to Yeshiva University was not at all the trajectory I was on. It was, uh, I can say, the greatest decision of my life. I had the tremendous, tremendous privilege of learning with my father for 10 years. And uh, I was in his shear in the afternoon. We learned uh, in the afternoon and at night as well. Whenever he didn't give a shear at night, we were learning in the house. And uh, just the wealth of knowledge that my father shared with me during those times. But more importantly, I mean, there are many, many venues where a person can gain knowledge, but just having the shimosh and being able to see uh, all kinds of fascinating questions that were coming up on a daily basis and life and death questions and just the entire gamut of Jewish life all coming together at one, at one seat in the base medrash or on one phone line in my parents' home was something that uh, I guess is a priceless experience. Now, it's interesting because I don't know how many people who studied in the mirror or 10 years with your father would end up in the young Israel of Woodmere, one of the key modern Orthodox schools in, in America, and running the base medrash. And how does that work? In other words, what do you do? Why did they bring you in? And what is your role there? And how are you teaching there? How does that work? So that's an interesting question. I actually started in the Rabbanus almost by mistake. Um, I was learning in YU. Uh, I was in the Kolo there. I was learning with my father. Uh, one fine day, Rabbi Eitan Feiner from the White Shul happened to be in YU for a bris of a family member of his. And he started getting into a conversation. He said, you know, um, I'm going away for Pesach. Your in-laws family doesn't live far from the White Shul. 
would you be willing to maybe fill in while I'm away over Yantif, give it Russia here, a Shear over there? I said, okay, well, I'm happy to try it out. Anyway, I tried it out. It was very nice. He said, you know, I'm going away in the summer. Uh, he goes to Camp Simcha for six weeks. So he said, maybe you want to stay by your in-laws for a couple of weeks. And we tried it out. It was great. The next year I became the rabbinic intern in the White Shul and then the assistant rabbi. And uh, I spent a really uh, very, very wonderful couple of years in the White Shul. Um, out of nowhere, I got a call from the young Israel of Woodmere and asked whether I would consider moving a couple of miles over to the Woodmere community, which I was not familiar with at all. At the time, I remember asking my father whether I should do this or not. And my father said very clearly, he said, there are so many shuls in the modern Orthodox community throughout the, throughout the country that look to the young Israel of Woodmere and try to you know, learn from certain things that are going on there. He said, if the young Israel of Woodmere is interested in investing in real Torah learning and other shuls across the country are going to be able to see that this is a priority for them, then he said that is something that is not only beneficial for the community you're going to, but something that could have implications nationally. And it was, uh, it was really almost a prophetic statement because there are so many shuls since that have try to adopt the same concept of hiring someone who is dedicated to Talmud Torah, to Limana Torah, to Paschal and Shailas. And um, especially in our community, it's important because when I first came here, obviously Rabbi Heshi Billet was the rabbi who we had a very close relationship. Um, he was then taken over by Rabbi Shalom Axarad, who's the full-time rabbi. And just the mere size of the community is so overwhelming with the life cycle events and with all the different uh, components that are going on at all times in the programs, to have somebody here that is dedicated to making sure that there's constant and consistent Lima Torah at all times was something that was a priority to both Rabbi Billet, to Rabbi Axarod, and to the entire lay leadership. And I think it's something to be proud of. So do you also serve there in a rabbinic role of drushas and life cycle and things like that as well? Yeah, so I, I speak every Shabbos. Um, I give shiurim during the week. We all have a rotation Shabbos morning. We have, I think, uh, 12, 13 Minyanim Shabbos morning. So there's a lot going on. And uh, we all rotate Minyanim. It keeps things exciting and interesting. And um, it, I guess it never gets boring. Sometimes, unfortunately, people get bored of hearing the same person over and over. But here, you never have the same rub twice in a, twice in a row, which has its challenges because it's hard to build a momentum and, and build up a theme if you're trying to over a number of weeks. But in general... Uh, we're an amazing team that get along really, really well. I remember uh, two or three years ago, I brought my father to visit the Spare Rebbe in Muncie. We happened to be in Muncie for a circus uh, over Chalamayid. Our family went together, went away together. And I asked my father, would you be interested in visiting the Spare Rebbe? He said, okay, we're here anyway. And they had a simple space in Shoeva. The kids wanted to go. So we all went. And uh, I had contacted the Spare Rebbe's offices, told them we were coming. Anyway, we had a whole discussion in the middle. The square Rebbe asked me, so where do you where do you work? So I said, I'm in the young Israel of Woodmere. He said, are you the Rav? I said, no, I'm not the Rav. There are, you know, there's a team. So he says, this is miraculous. I've never heard of such a thing. A couple of Rabbanim who are all on a team together and are able to work together and respect each other and give room and space for everyone to do what they're good at. Um, and he just said, you should appreciate the fact that you have that kind of setup because it's so unusual. And uh, And I did appreciate it. When he said it, and I continue to appreciate the beautiful working relationship that we all have together. No, that it's amazing. You know, your your father, as many of us know, had a brief period of time where he was a rub of a shul. Yeah, and then he came back to yeshiva. Actually, my uh, my connection with your father is interesting because my rosh yeshiva was Rav Moshe Hirschler Zetzal, who was at the time or earlier in the '60s was uh, giving shir at Yeshiva University. And when he had to go back to Israel, there was this young Talmud Chacham who they uh, appointed as a Rosh Hashiva to be able to take over for him, whose name was Rav Herschel Shechter. So uh, Rav Shechter and I share a connection to Rav Herschel's Zetzal in that as well. Well, but it, you're right in terms of working team, Baruch Hashem, and, 
in our shul in uh, Chicago, I have the privilege of working together with Rabbi Aaron Liebtag and also with Rabbi Yechiel Bressler, who are part of what we call a rabbinic team as well. We don't do as much rotating because we have two sites that we have to work on, but it is always a challenge. With your, but your father's strength wasn't necessarily in the Rabbonus in that sense. He is the Rav of the Rabbonin. Do you... It's interesting. My, my father has often told me um, there's nothing more terrifying to me than when my father shows up to a shear that I'm giving. Um, you know, my father in his humility often goes away for Shabbos and he looks at the schedule of the particular shul. And if he sees that the Rav or the Marda Asra is giving a Dafyomi shear of Shabbos morning, he will wake up early, show up to the shul, just like everybody else is expected to come. He feels he's expected to come as well. And I've often commented to him, you're not doing the rabbi a favor by showing up to his shear. He's much happier without you being there. And he says, why wouldn't I attend the shear? It's on the schedule. Like, of course I'm going to go. So my father has come to hear me uh, a number of times. And I always have the same uh, Yiras HaKavu when he's there. But at the same time, my father has commented to me afterward that he remembers there was a time when uh, there was an offer that Dr. Lamb had made to all the YU Rashi Yeshiva asking whether they want to take a class in, in speech, whether they want to take way out in their careers. You know, they were all teaching for many, many years already in YU. And Dr. Lamb had asked if anybody wants to take a public speaking course. And my father said that he raised his hand and uh, he didn't know whatever happened. So months later, he went back to Dr. Lamb and he asked him, you know, whatever happened to that class he spoke about. And he said, Dr. Lamb told him, well, you were sitting in the front of the room. You didn't notice that you were the only one to raise your hand. Nobody else <laughs> wanted it. So my father has often encouraged me that if you have the gift of, of being able to communicate and, and giving messages over that will be the two of Tom Vadas, then you have uh, then you have a responsibility. You have an achrayas to, to share that and to do what you can to inspire. So so you give so many shear. What's your favorite shear without getting anyone in trouble? What's the favorite shear that you give? Hard to say. I uh, I love to teach. I love to teach. I guess I was brought up in a home where it was all about education and there was such a focus on education. Um, but this really is a passion and it's a, a life mission. Hard to say what's the most uh, exciting shear. Um, I guess one of them would be Every Wednesday evening, I give a shear called Rabbis at Responsa, where I just take one of the questions that happened to have come up that week. And there are hundreds of questions that come up to a shul rev every week. And especially because of who my father is, very often people will call me to field questions to him. And I'll just break it down and try to explain what the issues are, what went into the psak, how it is that we came to a conclusion. Um, I think that's very exciting for people. I think it's informative. That's interesting. It, gives a certain sense of understanding of the fundamentals and foundations of halacha when you actually break it down and explain to people where Absak generates from. Um, that certainly. I also, I know that I've been giving a Perkei Avos series uh, to women on Tuesday morning, which has been going on for, I don't even know how many years. Somehow we're only in the beginning of Perak Beis. Uh, it's basically a shir in Hashkafa. Uh, it's not really on Pirkei Avos. We, we use the Pirkei Avos as the springboard, but that really is something that has generated a lot of excitement because it uh, really discusses openly hashkafic issues. And I try to bring in uh, much of what's going on from the news, much of what's happening in our world, uh, try to make it current and relevant and something that could be extremely engaging for people. So those are just some of them, but obviously all opportunities to teach Torah are exciting and uh, equally welcome. And, and how did you get involved with working with Yachad and Kem Simcha? Was it because of Rabbi Feiner or was there something else that happened? So Rabbi Feiner goes to Kem Simcha every uh, summer for six weeks. He had asked me at some point, I think it was six or seven years ago, I don't even remember when, whether I would do the first two weeks. Kem Simcha is an eight-week program. I really had no idea what I was signing up to at the time. Rabbi Feiner said to me, it's amazing. They have a beautiful base medrash. You're going to be able to sit there and just mind your own business and learn. And once in a while, when a mezuzah falls down and they have a shayla, how to put it back up, or when there's a shayla with Priya Satora, you'll answer a shayla. Uh, I thought that that was a great idea. We also felt as a family that to give our children the experience and the opportunity of 
seeing and experiencing this kind of, of camp, um, being able to be comfortable with children who have disabilities, with children who are battling chronic illnesses um, or cancer was an invaluable experience that we could never get for them anywhere else. And uh, we just felt that it would be an enriching experience for all of us. On top of that, my wife used to be a division head. Before we got married, she was a division head in Camp Simple. So she felt very comfortable there. Anyway, we went the first summer. Um, it was not at all what I had been told it was going to be. <laughs> I, um, Rabbi Feiner is a, is a great tzaddik. And um, you know he has a tremendous amount of focus. Uh, I, I'm just a regular guy. So when I came to camp, um, many, many of the campers had seen that as an opportunity to open up, tell their stories, talk, try to gain some chizuk, which there's very little to give to somebody, you know, unfortunately today, there was just a camper who was with us this summer who passed away, a very young girl. And it's a, it's a terrible tragedy. At least we look at it and we know that we gave her an amazing send off, shall we say, a uplifting and enriching experience before she had her last weeks on this earth. Um, but this was something that I did not expect at all. I did not anticipate at all. It was Shilas every single day from the infirmary, uh, doctors and nurses rushing in with critical questions. Shabbos was something that I was not at all prepared for. And uh, since then, we've really developed a tremendous curriculum for all the doctors and medical staff. I mean, Camp Simcha, I don't know if you're familiar, but Camp Simcha is really like a hospital. Um, it's not just an infirmary. It is a staff of paramedics, of EMTs, of doctors, of nurses, who all come together to collaborate to take care of these kids. And you have kids on active chemo. You have kids who are getting infusions. You have kids who are, I, I mean, just so much going on. So my first summer there, actually, um, I remember struggling with issues of emuna. I'll be honest, I, I felt it was just so powerful to see 200 kids or 150 kids who are struggling like this. And, and you know, how do we understand it? And I remember calling uh, my great teacher of Usher Weiss in Yerushalayim and I said to him, you know, is there something wrong with me? The fact that I'm having major emuna issues watching all of this. And he told me something that's been extremely uh, impactful, but also um, has charted the course of so much of, of what many of us do there. He has told me that, who do you think is the greatest believer in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in all the pages of Chumash? And I said, Avram Avinu. So he said, well, what you may not know is after all that Avram Avinu did, the Medrash says, he comes home from the Akedah only to find his wife, Sari Imenu, has passed away. And the Medrash records a gripping conversation where Avram Avinu opens up and he says, like, what do you want from me? Esma you first told me, then you told me, I bring him up, I go out of my way, I do everything for you. I finally come to the Mizbeach, I bind up my son Yitzchak, I'm ready to sacrifice him as you instructed me to do. And then you tell me to take him down. Now I come home and you take my wife away. What do you want from me? Hischil Abram Avinu Tameya are the words of the Medrash. And Rav Asher said, does that mean that Avraham Avinu goes down in history as any less of a believer than you thought he was? No. Part of the challenge of a believer is that at times throughout life, if you're a serious person, you're going to have questions on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The same way Moshe Rabbeinu did, the same way all of the Nevi'im describe their challenges at different points in their lives. So that's something that really has guided me and helped me. Um, in terms of the medical side of things and, and the halacha, you know, these are Dvarim Ha'omdim Ruma Shalolam, and uh, these are Shilas that are critical questions. That first summer, I actually asked Rabbi Asher Weiss when he was in New York, I asked him to come pay us a visit because he is the Rav of Shari Tzedek Hospital. I asked him to come for a day. At the time, his wife was very sick with cancer, and he said, Shai, don't depress me. I don't want to go to a camp with 150 kids who are sick with cancer. I said, trust me, this is the happiest place you'll ever be. And he said, it can't be. He said, okay, fine. I'll come for a few minutes. I'll give five minutes of chizuk, but then I'm leaving. He came. A couple of hours later, he left. Um, he sat down with many, many of the campers. He sat down with the entire medical staff, and we had a very open discussion about things that we can learn from how Shari Tzedek deals with different Shabbos issues and, and medicine. And it was an absolutely amazing day. I remember just uh, the highlight of it all was 
there was an Israeli camper who was in. They have about 25, 30 campers that come every summer from Eretz Israel. And this Israeli camper had come and uh, she had actually made a candle. They have a candle making shop with those beautiful Abdullah candles. So when after Rav Usher Weiss got up to speak, she got up and she asked him to sit down for a moment. He sat down, he didn't know what was happening. And she said, I know you're living through a very difficult time. Your wife is very sick with cancer, but so am I. And I want you to know I made this Abdullah candle and I was gonna bring it home to my family, but I hope you'll bring it home. I'm gonna give it to you as a gift to know that there's somebody who's sick with cancer who brings light into the world. And regardless of how sick I am, I bring light into the world like all of us do. And she presented him with this gift with a beautiful card in Hebrew. It was so moving, it was so inspiring, but there are so many special and inspiring moments there in the camp. Um, it's fascinating and it's, uh, I, I can only imagine, you know, the emotion of that, of that experience. And your connection with, with Rav Asher Weiss goes back to when you came, when you came to learn in Israel, but it's, it's been a couple yeah. of years. You've really become his man in, uh, in the United States. So I would venture to guess. And... Baruch Hashem. It's a, it's a big schus. Uh, we got to know each other when I was first learning in Eretz Yisrael when I was single. Um, I used to go to his weekly shear and, um, uh, it, it was really something that blossomed from there. We used to learn together a lot. We spent a lot of time. At the time when I started going to his shir, my father had never met him. My father did not know who he was. Over the years, as, as the relationship between myself and Rav Asher Weiss developed, um, him and my father have also become very dear friends. They have tremendous respect for each other. I often am asked Shilas, not because people want my opinion, but because they know that I can ask my father or Rav Asher Weiss. And I always make a point to ask both of them everything. Um, they disagree a lot. I find it very, very interesting in the points of disagreement. Um, I do find that their, their way of thinking, their logic is very similar. They're just both very practical. They both have a tremendous understanding of people. And that goes into the psaq that they give. Um, and that's always a tremendous factor in the discussion and in the psaq that's ultimately rendered. But there's always a nuance and there's always something to be learned from each of them. And there's always something that's added by having a discussion with each of uh, each of these great gedolim. And that's why I try as much as I can to discuss almost everything with both of them. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned before that, you know, Chayi HaKehila is not so much my father's uh, focus. He really deals with this Talmidim. He's not so much involved in, in the Rabbanus. Um, I will say I talk to my father almost every day. We, we discuss Shailas all the time. We talk about issues. But when I have a Shaila about the Kehila in general, uh, when I have a Shaila often about how to deal with an individual person or how to deal with, you know, something that's going on that's very serious in the community or even I'll say a political question. My father uh, stays very far away from politics. He's completely uninvolved. Um, but he has encouraged that if you're in a position where you are able to be influential in certain ways, you have to take advantage of those opportunities. So what do you do when you're invited to attend or participate or play a major role in a major political event? And uh, you don't really know what to say. You don't really know how to say it. And you don't really know what your role should be. Um, I have very often consulted with Rav Asher Weiss about those issues. And he always has a, a tremendously refreshing perspective that is always very, very helpful. So our time is almost up. If I can ask one last question, and I'm- been it. We, 130, 130 is a hard stop. That's how you do it? Well, that's how we do it. So we maybe go a minute over. Okay. Back with your Hever went to Lakewood. What would they say to you now? After all you've done, after getting a master's degree at, at Azraeli, getting smicha from YU, becoming a Rav and a young Israel. So it's funny. I, I am in touch with some of the Chaverim once in a while. Obviously, life has gotten busier and families have grown, Baruch Hashem, and opportunities and responsibilities have come all of our way. Uh, so we don't talk that often. But I do hear from them on solemn occasion and uh, seldom occasion. But when do I hear from them? Primarily when they've come across a sheer of mine on the internet and they have something to say about it. That to me is, uh, is beautiful, that our relationship now is so much focused on Lima Torah and on inspiring each other. And that's really when I hear from them. And it's, uh, 
it's a privilege. It's a gift. I feel it's uh, the greatest privilege to be part of those who are trying to be Osikutsar Hitzibur, trying to be there for HaKadosh Baruch Hu's people. And uh, I don't take it for granted that we've been given this gift. And on that note, I want to thank you, but I want to reserve the possibility that maybe one time in the future we can continue this conversation because it's fascinating. What you have been able to accomplish in your years in the Rabonis is extraordinary. And the way you've been able to accomplish it is really a model to so many people. I don't know if you appreciate how many Rabbonim in America today look to the work that you're doing and the Rabbi Axelrod is doing in the Young Israel. And as you say, it's a, your father said it would be a, a model. It is a model. And you have a very, very significant piece of creating something new within our world that's centered around Torah. So thank you so very much, Rav Shai. I appreciate this time and my best to the entire family. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. And anytime, happy to pick up the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. And have a wonderful day. You Bye -bye. too. All the best. Thank you.